Llegar a ti cada mañana, sentir tu amor dentro de mí, sentir el fuego de tu abrazo y comenzar un día feliz. Buscar tu amor en cada acto y ser testigo de tu amor, de la humildad y el sacrificio, tu cuerpo y sangre, Señor. Y sentir que estás vivo, Señor, y sentir que eres grande, mi Dios, y llevarte conmigo a donde yo voy, para llevar a otros la alegría de tu amor, y gritarle al mundo que eres grande. Eres Dios. Andar viviendo en tu presencia, ver el milagro de mi vida. Que siendo poco nada, hoy soy criatura nueva, gracias al poder de tu perdón. Y es que, Señor, yo veo tu mano en todas partes donde voy. En me al ir a recibirte buscando como un niño tu perdón y sentir que estás vivo Señor y sentir que eres grande mi Dios y llevarte conmigo a donde yo voy para llevar a otros 
la alegría de tu amor y gritarle al mundo que eres grande, que eres Dios, que eres Dios. conmigo a donde yo voy para llevar a otros la alegría de tu amor y gritarle al mundo que eres grande que eres Dios y gritarle al mundo que eres grande eres Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, give me And when I am alone, oh, when I am alone, and when I am alone, give me Jesus, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, you can have all this world. Give me Jesus, and when I come to die, oh, when I come to die. And when I come to thy, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, give me Jesus.
Y algún día en la batalla Me faltará tu fuerza Si algún día en la noche Me faltará tu luz Si algún día en el desierto Me faltará tu agua Si algún día en la prueba Me faltará tu amor ¿A dónde iré? ¿A quién iré? Si solo tú tienes palabras de vida eterna ¿A dónde iré? ¿A quién iré? Si solo tú me consuelas de mis tristezas ¿A dónde iré? Cuando me falte tu presencia ¿A quién iré? Cuando tu espíritu toda luz se apague si solo tú tienes palabras de vida eterna si solo tú tienes palabras de vida eterna si solo tú tienes palabras de vida eterna St. Anne Catholic Church in Wichita presents St. Anne Corner Stream, a program focused on the evangelization and the spreading of the news of Jesus Christ. And now, with you, St. Anne 
corn stream. I used to be a journalist. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Welcome, everyone, to the St. Hank Quarren stream. Uh, let us begin tonight with a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we praise you and thank you for your great gifts and your blessings to us. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to, to gather together tonight here with, uh, with our bishop, uh, with our parishioners and, and friends. Uh, joining us from uh, from around the area, we pray that you would bless this time together, fill us with your Holy Spirit. We ask these things as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so welcome as we gather together tonight, continuing to, um, <clears throat> to reflect on, on our experience here during this time away from the church and trying to give people opportunities to stay connected. Um, tonight, we've uh, we've invited Bishop Kemi to be with us to share uh, some of his uh, his reflections and his uh, and his experiences, and so we're we're happy to have him with us. Of course, with me also is uh, Father Clay Kimbrough, uh, Joel Rosario, our music director, and uh, many people watching us right now online. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, you know, Bishop uh, would love it if I, I know I know. Um, you know, I've spoken with you many times. Father Clay has. Uh, Joel met you before the show tonight. I know a number of our uh, viewers maybe never have. Um, you want to take some time to kind of introduce yourself, how you uh, kind of came to, to know Jesus and end up as a, as a priest and, and our bishop? Sure, sure. Well, greetings, everyone, and thanks for the invitation to, uh, to join you this evening. It's uh, it's amazing. Uh, I'm getting more and more of these invitations and, and opportunities to to um, connect with people in schools and faculties, and now you know just a whole parish like Saint Anne's. So greetings to uh, to all the parishioners of Saint Anne's. Uh, grateful that uh, you're taking some time with us this evening. Um, I um, so I don't know where to begin. I um, you know the question as well, you know, discipleship and when I became, so I was thinking about that question earlier and actually I have a date when I became a disciple of Jesus Christ. <laughs> it's August 20th, 1960 is the day of my baptism. I was one week old and uh, that's when I became a, a true disciple of Jesus. And uh, of course then, you know, everything, um, you know, I was born into a Catholic family and uh, raised Catholic from the get-go and, uh, and uh, you know, went uh, from, you know, from baptism all the way through and received all my sacraments. And uh, I didn't have the, uh, I didn't have the joy or the honor of attending a Catholic grade school. Uh, I grew up in a small parish, a country parish in the middle of central Illinois. And uh, our little parish wasn't able to offer a Catholic uh, grade school education. So went to public schools, uh, but we went to mass every Sunday. My family was a, are, uh, were and are devout Catholic, uh, German Catholics. Um, being Catholic was just part of who we were. Uh, there was no, there's no question about, you know, going to church on Sunday or, or believing in the teachings of the church or practicing our faith. Uh, it was just, uh, you know, we just, assumed or it was assumed that that was the way we we're going to live and um, and so that was very normal to me I mean uh, uh, our large Catholic family we we uh, we have a lot I have lots of cousins and uh, I've you know four brothers and a sister and um, not many priests or religious in the family until I came along but um, but we were just Catholic to the core as I say I uh, like to say and uh, and still are in many ways 
Um, and that was my, that was my experience. Uh, uh, I thought, you know, I couldn't figure out why everyone wasn't Catholic, <laughs> why everyone wasn't going to church on Sunday like I was or going, you know, to a catechism class. Uh, though back though in those years, we called it catechism. I'm, I think they call it PSR today. I'm not sure. But it was Saturday mornings and uh, every Saturday morning from about nine o'clock until noon, we went to our little parish church and some nuns came from the neighboring town and taught us religion and taught us our catechism and taught us all about our faith. And uh, you know, we made our first communion, made our first confession and was confirmed. And, and then, uh, but uh, early on, pretty early on, actually, in my first Holy Communion, I was really, um, I think, given my at least the awareness of a vocation to the priesthood. Um, when our parish priest was giving me Holy Communion that day, I'll never forget it. I could see it in my mind. I'll, now, uh, you know, what was it? Um, you know, 52 years ago, uh, I can see all the, I can see this Father giving me the, the the Blessed Sacrament for the very first time, and I was so so touched by that and i felt then uh, that i wanted to do that i wanted to be able to offer people holy communion and be offer be able to offer the mass and to live the, the life of a priest i didn't realize of course understand fully understand what that would entail or what it all meant but i believe that was the moment it was kind of the central moment i've told this vocation story many many times and I just think that was the moment for me when God shined a light. I think our vocations, whatever they are, priesthood or religious life or married life or single life, are chosen for us. Um, and then God shines a light in, in, in our time. Sometimes he does it real early, like what he did for me as a small boy, seven-year-old, seven, eight-year-old boy. Sometimes he waits a little later in life. Um, and then the light is shined upon us and our mind our, our our mind is opened up to the possibility of of serving him in that particular way um, but that desire was there from a very early age and it really never ever left me i thought about doing many many other things with my life and i grew up on a farm and um, kind of it was assumed that many of us would become farmers and uh, my couple of my brothers did and, and my grandparents were both farmers, and, uh, but it was pretty clear to me that I was not cut out to be a farmer. <laughs> I enjoyed being on the farm. I just didn't like the work of a farmer. So a different kind of farmer, really, in a way, a different planter of seeds. Uh, a priest is like a, a farmer who plants seeds and, you know, hopefully harvests some of them and, and then, um, you know, goes about that his work in a different spiritual way. Um, but so, yeah, that was, uh, that's kind of the, the genesis, if you will, the beginning of, of my vocation. And, you know, later on, as I would go through grade school and early into high school, I discerned this even more uh, seriously and, you know, um, thought, well, I'm going to give it a try. So I applied for seminary and, and I went, I had no idea if I was going to be able to do it. I didn't realize, I didn't think I was always very, I didn't think I was very smart um, or at least smart enough, but I knew I had to try. And then when I got to that place called a seminary, I felt like I had arrived and felt like maybe uh, this was the right place for me. And, and then the years passed one after the other with all kinds of challenges, of course, as the fathers will recognize, remember from your seminary days. Uh, those are not easy days or easy years. They're meant to be kind of challenging and building uh, up this person that we're supposed to become, forming us, we, we call it, forming us like the, the, the potter forms the clay. Uh, we don't go into the seminary coming out, you know, being the priest the church needs us to be. We go in there to be formed and to be molded. And uh, that's not easy. Uh, it's often sometimes uh, a little a little daunting. Uh, and there were moments, of course, like every everyone, uh, where you wondered if you were cut out for this. And, and um, but God, God prevailed and God's grace preserved me and sustained me throughout those many years. 
in the seminary, and then I was, uh, thanks be to God, ordained a priest on May 10th, 1986. So here in a few few days, few weeks, it'll be 34 years ago. So Beautiful. old. We're certainly <laughs> glad you made it. I made it. I the made next it. natural question I feel like any kid in a classroom would ask is, how did you decide to become a bishop? Yeah, well, I didn't. <laughs> exactly, right? <laughs> How did I decide to become a bishop? I, <laughs> Pope Francis decided it. Exactly. So I was uh, I was kind of doing my thing in Springfield, Illinois. I was serving in chancery work and and doing some parish work and so forth. Happy, very happy, and I love being a parish priest. I I miss that. I I envy you guys in the parish. I uh, I would um, almost on any given day give everything that I have here away and do what you guys do. So I really miss being a pastor, being a parish priest. I think I've always said this, you guys have heard me say this, it's the best job in the church. Oh yeah. <laughs> Far sure. better than being a bishop. Yeah. Far better than being a bishop. But you know, the church is made up of, you know, we the way it works, we have to have leaders. We have to have bishops and pastors and parish priests and others. And so some of us have to Take on that, that leadership, and uh, so the point. The point is, the Pope appoints us, and um, and then he lets us know that he's appointed us, and then we have to say yes. Uh, and uh, you know, hopefully, we're responding in obedience uh, to that call. It's not a call I would have chosen. Uh, certainly, never sought, and I'm, I'm still not convinced. I'm very, very qualified for it, uh, but I trust. You know, and. Uh, I have always uh, tried to say yes to God's will, and I uh, will continue to do that in any given day uh, because I believe there are blessings that come when we do that, even though uh, you know, it may not be something we chose for ourselves but, uh, or would choose for ourselves and would rather not do, but we do it out of obedience and, and, and uh, conformity to God's will. So, so May, or, uh, yeah, May 1st, <laughs> this Friday, It'll be uh, my sixth anniversary. So six years ago, uh, I was getting ready for the biggest transition of my life to move from Illinois, to move from my family and all my friends and, and brother priests out there and, and to plant myself here in a place I'd never been to, I'd never been to before and, and didn't know anything about, uh, didn't know any of you and didn't know, you know, I, I'd heard of Wichita, but I never ever been here, and so um, the Lord works in very mysterious ways. Very mysterious ways. So yeah, six years, and here I am. You know, and uh, God willing, you know, I'd like to be here. I'm going to be 60 here in August. So um, I've got if my health continues to flourish, which I praise God if it will, please God it will, I'll be able to be here another 15 years. <laughs> Perfect. If you're ready for that, guys, we're all set. Don't say anything. Don't say anything. Of course, you're all happy for yeah. 15 more years. We're not going to jinx it. Father Clay is already planning the birthday party. Okay. We talked That's about right. it. Fun Father fact: I have the same birthday except two different years. That's right. It's a it's a blessed day, and we have the same initials. Same initials, same birthday. We won't say how many years apart. Um, well, 30 years that's, to the day, because it's pretty amazing. That's so. why, don't test, but you're my favorite. <laughs> wow. I knew it. I we'll have that recorded on YouTube. So, <laughs> Bishop, thanks for that testimony. That was a, dad know. <laughs> <laughs> perfect. So, he'll be 60, I'll be 30. It'll be a wonderful party if we can gather that's with right. other 30 people years? this August. Yeah. That's right. Oh my guys. So you were born 30 years after I was August 14th, born. 1990 and 1960. Pretty crazy. That is that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So Bishop, thank you for that testimony. I think actually it's perfect for this Sunday. I just want to give a little preview. This Sunday is you know, what we call typically Good Shepherd Sunday and uh, Father Chad Arnold, our vocation director, sent out an email to all of us priests about how it's also the World Day of Prayer uh, for vocations. So a perfect reflection for this Sunday's upcoming. But what we also like to do on the show each week is kind of talk about the past Sunday's gospel. Um, so Father David preached. We're alternating weekends here, as many priests are, 
Father, would you like to share just briefly what you kind of focused on this Sunday or any more takes that you had after it, and then maybe kick it to Bishop for his thoughts on the road to Emmaus gospel. I don't know if I can do it briefly, but. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> it was a seven point homily. You have an eighth mm-hmm. point for us? Uh, you know, I, I, so, um, you know, I, I was struck in, in Bishop in, in your testimony, um, the, uh, you know, watching, watching the priest give communion and, and thinking that that'd be something you'd want to do. And, um, I found myself like, so I remember the first time I gave out Holy Communion. Um, I was a seminarian and, uh, I, I was uh, doing totus to us and I was, uh, asked to do that. The, pre- the, the priest wasn't able to be there for mass that day. And so, so we did a little communion service and, um, got asked to distribute communion. And, and like, I was so afraid that God was going to smite me for, uh, for like, you know, overstepping. And, um, but, but I just remember the experience and how, how beautiful it was. And I find myself kind of longing for, for that, for that part of the mass, um, distributing communion again. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but here this past Sunday with the, the road to Emmaus, we were reflecting on how, you know, the, the Lord first, he comes to us and, um, and it's always, you know, it's always his initiative and, uh, you know, whether it's, um, you know, my story or, you know, your story, how, you know, you talked about like being, being raised in it from the very beginning, the Lord was coming to you. And, um, we think about the times when we, when we wander, the Lord does something to, to bring us back. And for many of us, you know, that happens in a conversation with someone. Father Clay and I were talking about earlier today about how so often that happens with, uh, with families, um, you know, spending time just sitting around talking about their faith, being, being ready to do that. And, um, you know, I'm so moved. I've gotten to know uh, Joelle's family. Um, they, they seem to do that very well. And they have a, it's kind of a beautiful way of, of doing that, of being that, that instrument for the Lord in, um, you know, so, so that we can be set up like, like those two disciples, you know, in the midst of that conversation where the Lord appears and does his work and, and brings them back, but then ultimately bringing them uh, to the Eucharist where they're able to have that, uh, that, that fuller, uh, fuller experience of communion with him and, um, and then being sent, and then being sent again on mission to bring others in, into that experience as well. Bishop, any thoughts on the road to Emmaus gospel from this Sunday? Yeah, that's, um, you know, I've always amazed how, you know, one, one gospel story is, uh, is so powerful that it can be interpreted and seen in completely different ways. I, uh, I reflected at the beginning about what a treasure that story was to the early church. It must have been and repeated uh, in the oral tradition before it was ever written down of how you know, first person, family to family, Christian community to Christian community would have shared that story as a way of forming disciples and and uh, and, and uh, encouraging really the early Christians who, who I am convinced face far greater trials than we are facing today, um, and how that story can uh, really encourage us. So, you know, like Father David said, you know, the the Lord drew near. And, uh, and he takes the initiative in our life. It's a beautiful way to see it. Uh, the Lord drew near to them. They were walking away from sadness and, and distress, overwhelmed by all that they had experienced, but trying to kind of put the pieces in their life back together. And, and Jesus pieces all that together for them and when he opens the scriptures. And, and uh, that's what our call is as homilous preachers are to open the scriptures, to break open that word for our people, for ourselves first, and then for our people um, to um, connect the dots uh, uh, in, in ex- human experience, God's covenant and will, and then uh, how, do, how does that make sense? Uh, and in that, that of course, in the, in, the, in the climax of that, in the breaking open of the bread, their eyes were open and they recognized him and, and the sadness and the distress and the consternation all disappeared. And then they rushed back to Jerusalem and to proclaim and to witness. And that's what we're called to do, just to go forward and proclaim 
and be witnesses. Uh, Peter, St. Peter in the second reading said, uh, of this we are all witnesses. Uh, and we have to remember that's our role as disciples, to be really a witness to the risen Christ in the world today. And what an important role and responsibility that is in the world that's awash in confusion and sadness and the same emotions that gripped the hearts of those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. You know, a lot of people understandably are questioning God and, you know, what's happening and the world is turned upside down just as their world was. And so the word right now is what we can share is God's word and, and, and the scriptures. Um, soon, very soon, hopefully, we'll be able to share once again the breaking of the Eucharistic bread. But right now we can share the, the word, which is a, a main powerful presence of Jesus. In our, we learned that in the seminary, you know, that Jesus is, is, when we preach the word, Jesus is as present as he is in the tabernacle, <laughs> as he is in the altar. And that, that, that same presence of the word is, is still alive in the church today. And it's that word, if we break it open faithfully and lovingly and uh, responsibly, it can help people connect the dots in their lives. So that's kind of my take on, on what the road to Emmaus uh, meant back then, 21 centuries ago, and can mean for us today. So beautiful. So you didn't preach, Father Clay? Huh? I didn't. I actually I was on retreat last week oh, okay. um, with three other of our brother priests, and okay. so Father gave me the weekend off. But I felt mm -hmm. like on retreat, it was kind of the same same thought. You know, obviously, I actually have the big painting of the road to Emmaus in my room over in the rectory, and. Um, it's, it was in my parents' house before I went to seminary and I robbed it one time when I was home from seminary and just love that image of the fact that he is always on the road with us, um, ever present, even when we don't recognize him. And certainly I think that's a great, uh, kind of lead into, uh, one of our biggest questions, which I think you could shed some light on for the people is just kind of even when we don't feel his presence, which is very hard for people right now um, who are so used to the sacramental economy, which is a blessing. And I think one of the best things that's going to come out of this is that people are going to have a greater hunger and desire for the Eucharist when it comes back. Um, what was it like having to make that hard decision? I know you voiced it to us as priests, but what would you tell the people about that decision that had to be made about uh, suspending public mass for the time being and what these last couple months have been like for you. Yeah, that's, um, thanks for asking that. It's, um, um, as I've said, you know, it's hope, hopefully I'll never have to make a decision like that again. It's, uh, it's so counterintuitive for a bishop or a priest or any of us to keep people away from a sacrament. Um, I know, um, the week that that was made, I forget exactly the time frame, but the four, bish the four bishops uh, in Kansas, myself included, we, we were um, conference calling each other and, and we were hearing from, from all these uh, different areas, uh, different people that said, you know, this is, this is, this, it's going to be really important that we kind of re, uh, help people restrict um, away from gar gatherings. And so we, uh, we talked a lot about that. I, I remember two, two or three nights, I think we were in Prince call with each other. And we came to the conclusion that, you know, if we do it, we wanted to do it together so that it didn't look like one Bishop was, you know, in conflict with another Bishop or one diocese with another. And thanks be to God, we, we were able to do that together. Uh, we were trying to find ways early on of how we might be able to have um, the mass with smaller numbers. I think the original number was 50, maybe 100, and then it went down to 50. And it was just whittling down, and it was, it was becoming uh, practically impossible of how to do that without having, you know, many, many more masses. So we all came to the conclusion that, that though we didn't want to do it, that we felt that it was uh, it was the right call. 
I, I think it was the right decision. It was, it was really tough. I mean, and I get notes, you know, and, and emails and messages from people that are all across the board, whether they think it was the right decision or that it was the most horrible thing you've ever done. And, um, you know, why could you, how could you have ever done that to us to, you know, and everything in the middle. Uh, and I understand that. I mean, people, it took something very important and treasured away from our people. Um, <clears throat> and so that's why it made it gut wrenching. I, I, I don't mean that I don't, I don't want to use that word lightly, but it's still, you know, as I, uh, as I go to prayer every day and, sit before the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament in my little chapel here in the house. And as I offer the Mass and receive the Lord and somewhat, you know, with a guilty, guilty feeling, you know, uh, I still question whether that was the right decision. Um, and, I, and I wrestle with that. I mean, I think that's yeah. what parents and, you know, people in responsibility, they do, if they, if they do wrestle with those kind of decisions, honestly, and, uh, I think people need to realize it wasn't an arbitrary thing. It wasn't, a, right. you know, like, well, you know, just take it away. It was, it was really, sure. and then since then, <clears throat> from the gut wrenching, okay, how can we get back to having mass? Right. How long will this be? And what, debit, what, what effect will this have on our, on our Christian community, on our parishes? Um, and of course, you who are priests, you shared all that with me and, and, the, and the anxiety that that caused. Um, you know, in our parish life and, and uh, you know, in our schools and everything. So that anxiety was very real. That fear was, is, is very real. Um, I think people have uh, grown a little accustomed to it, but, but ho thankfully not too accustomed to it. Right. Uh, to want to just say, well, this is, all, this is, this is as good as, as, you know, going to Mass. Yeah. Uh, it isn't. It isn't. And um, right now we're, we're working on, some viable plans, you know, it depends on a lot of things. Uh, in the next couple of days, we'll know more, but, it, but we're working on a plan where we can uh, reopen to public masses, but it's going to be gradual. And that's one, something I think our people are going to have to, again, adjust to and realize that this isn't going to happen overnight, that this could be several months where we make these gradual increments, hopefully, and adjustments of, of uh, the medical experts tell me that it's likely going to be 12 to 18 months before we're back to where we were before pandemic in terms of mass attendance. That's a long time. Uh, and that's hard. That's even hard for me to even, um, you know, accept yeah. or to, uh, you know, agree to, but and the, the way this is looking, it's, I think they may be right. I hope they're wrong, but I, but I think they may be right. And but when, you, then, when you say back to where we were, you're you know, talking about packed churches. Yeah, yeah. Where people just come without any restrictions. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, so, but until then, I think we have to, you know, do our very, very best to invite people to uh, use their good judgment, use prudence, use um, wisdom, and then make make uh, proper choices about, you know, being in these gatherings, you know. So just like we've had to do in these last month or so, you know, whether we should go to the store or not, whether we should go here or not, um, you know, preferring to stay out of larger gatherings uh, for the safety of everyone involved. So yeah, um, we'll see. There have been, but it, but it was it was not pleasant. It is not pleasant, and. Um, but um, you know, I, I've I've wondered why God, you know, you know, puts us in these situations. And as I told the priests, you know, early on, uh, it came it came it was laid on my heart in prayer. You know, we, you know, God had us in mind when He ordained us and appointed us at this time in the church that we would experience this crisis and maybe other crises to come. Right. Uh, and He and He's given you and me and all of our people, the wisdom and the faith and the, the insight and the courage to work through that and to offer the Lord um, a great and heroic service. So that's what I hope 
uh, we're all doing and continue to do in the in the weeks and months ahead. There have been a number, and I'm sure you've seen it, of beautiful things that have come. Uh, obviously, there's always good that God can bring about from every evil, and I think tops of which for me have for us have been teaching people about spiritual communion, teaching people about the value of the sacrifice of the mass and why are, you know, we preached a homily on why are priests still celebrating mass without the people and just kind of the understanding of, of mass as a sacrifice and just so many different opportunities to say, um, you know, this is our faith and, and mass is still happening. Jesus is still being worshiped and adored. Um, this isn't like the world war where we had to celebrate mass underground. In fact, in this case, we are a harm, can be a harm to each other, and we have to protect our, our most vulnerable and, and just so many good good things that have come of it. Um, and I, chief of which I think is just so many friends have mentioned how much they miss, you know. Um, I miss Sundays. I miss that and it's not just i miss coming to a building what do you actually miss i miss receiving the eucharist um we had confessions outside a couple weeks ago before easter and we had so many people there who said they hadn't you know i hadn't i hadn't seen them before they hadn't been in a while and they said father i never realized you know as i was rushing into mass with getting my kids ready and and getting frustrated, you know, how much I took it for granted because I just miss it so much now. And I, I can't wait to see them back again soon. And I think um, there's going to be a beautiful renaissance of what the Eucharist means to us as a people and what uh, the true presence means. Joel, would you um, share with us a song as you usually do? Um and you play this song at our parish all the time, and it's an original, I believe, right? So can you tell us about how you came to write this song? You're muted. Okay. You hear me now? <laughs> yep. Okay, great. Well, this song, uh, it was a moment of pray. It was justice. It was a moment that I was... Uh, uh in, in that moment i remember i was having a that issue uh, there's something I, I i i was trying to understand about my son to 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 take the right decision uh because sometimes kids can be complicated in some way and you want to do the best for them so i i said well lord i don't know what to do and I was really uh, kind of say upset for this moment because uh, I really was asking the, the Holy Spirit to, to show me what to do. And I received the communion and in the, it was in the morning mass and I just wrote this. I, the first moment I just improvised. I need a song for communion and I just start to sing what I was feeling. Uh, and then I wrote, it's a simple, it's a simple pray, but it's a song that I really feel that it helped me to really understand uh, who I am and who is God. And, uh, and, and for the grace of the Lord, people who are here, hearing, they, not only like it, they say I like the song, but it's, I think it's most that they can feel the same thing. It's, yeah. it's the Lord. Yeah. yeah. So I want to share this song with you. Jesus, I need you. And it's very, I just think it's so meditative and beautiful in that regard. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. You just let me know if you hear good the balance. Mm -hmm. I 
Thank you, Joel. Beautiful. Thank you. We would like to invite callers. Um, we've got 51 watching right now. 316-522-2383 is the number. We do have a couple um, people in the office ready to take your call for Bishop. This is your chance, right? How often do you get to ask the Bishop a question? So please call in. Bishop, I'm curious. Just one question I had on my mind tonight was, what are you doing with your quarantine time? You know, everybody seems to have a different thing. Maybe it's not much different than usual. Maybe you're more busy than usual. I don't know. But this is your normal time for confirmations, and you don't have those. So have yeah. you found any new hobbies or anything? Well, you know, um, people ask me that. I Several of our priests over here at the Priest Retirement Center, they, they said, well, you have all this free time, you know. <laughs> and I don't feel like I have all this free time, even though, the calendar, the schedule is uh, a little different. Um, you know, uh, all these confirmations that we had scheduled, and this was a really busy time for that. Um, we have 20, I think somebody told me we have 25 yet to go. <laughs> so it was a lot. Uh, so those will have to be either rescheduled or handled in a different way. But, uh, but so naturally, my evenings are a little... Uh, uh, un, uh, spoken for, not, not they're, they're not spoken for. So the evenings are different now than what they normally would have been. Tonight I was supposed to be at St. Ben Andover to have confirmation. So, um, so when I get home from the office, I, I, uh, I try to, um, try to, you know, spend a quiet evening if I can. Um, so when I think of my, time that I would have normally been doing something else. So I, I try to get to bed very early. 
um, I'm getting older, so I, uh, I, I need more sleep. So <laughs> I don't mind admitting. So I, I get to bed fairly early, but I also get up very early because I'm a morning person. And that's when I pray the best and I, you know, read and study and do some things in the morning, exercise if I can. Uh, but in the nighttime, I, I keep it fairly quiet. So I, you know, I, I prepare a little supper for myself and do some reading and, um, you know, um, connecting with family and friends. And uh, also, you know, because so much is changing in this time, you know, it's really, it's really good and important for me to stay uh, current on, you know, uh, what's happening in the state, what's happening in the county, um, in terms of this pandemic. So, so I'm at least informed, informed enough to be able to make decisions. So uh, I right. also, also do uh, some writing and some preparing, uh, homily preparation, so forth like that. But one of the things I have rediscovered, it's really wonderful because uh, out behind my house here, there's some ponds and the fish are now biting. <laughs> so uh, I like to fish. I'm not a, not a great fisherman. I don't have a lot of patience if they're not biting, but when they're biting, I can spend a lot of time out nice. there. Uh, and uh, so I went out um, last, what's today, Tuesday? Oh yeah, Monday, um, last night, and uh, had a nice, nice evening, uh, about an hour out there catching, you know, about a six or seven small crappie, you know, nothing I, I keep. Perfect. I just take that, but, so I like that, and I, uh, I, I, uh, I try to stay connected to our retired priests over here, and so I'll walk over there and say hello to them from time to time. And so things like that, simple things, I, I, nothing really major. Um, I'm a big advocate of, of reading good books, um, not, not um, worthless uh, uh, or, or, uh, or books that don't really matter. I like to read uh, some classic novels, so I'm a kind of a Charles Dickens fan. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm reading some of some of the classics that we may have read in high school or college literature classes, rereading them. And uh, not to be, uh, you know, a literary snob or anything, but I really enjoy no. uh, reading those kind of things that enlighten the mind and lift up the imagination and, and uh, give you some other ways of viewing the world and viewing yourself. So I highly recommend that. So very know. good. You're you not helping. Record? You're not helping Netflix's stock in, increase like everyone else in the world. That's I have that's Netflix, good. but I but they're not <laughs> they're not getting rich on me. So <laughs> <laughs> very good. Uh, what have we been doing? Um, I've been listening to a lot of podcasts. It's kind of the age of the podcast. Everybody is starting one because they're bored. So between uh, some great religious podcasts and. Uh, try to avoid the political ones and uh, some some good sports ones. I was excited about the NFL draft because we had one tiny bit of sports in the midst of all this, but that's over and so that's okay. And Father and I have been eating dinner a lot more together, which I'm sure you've heard from other priests, which is wonderful. I thank God that it has been um, nice outside and it's not happening. This virus isn't happening yet during the winter uh, because it's just been I've taken up pickleball it's my new favorite sport it's like an in between tennis and ping pong and it's a great social distancing sport because you're about you know 20 feet you, away uh, from so father yep. do, can, you have to do perspire playing pickleball <laughs> you can work up a sweat yeah it's definitely <laughs> it's not as <laughs> strenuous as tennis so, which, it's the sport of the senior like citizen the sweat no shame. It's a little bit of sweat. Yeah. It's, it's, it's nice. Gets the, gets the blood flowing. Can I, Father, what about you? Uh, I've been, um, doing, doing a little more reading and some, uh, some good running and, um, kind of just enjoying some, enjoying some slower nights, uh, sitting out on the patio and, uh, lighting a fire out there and, uh, and then spending more time talking with my family. Perfect. I'm kind of so, like the bishop, though. Like my calendar is empty, but my days are full. You yeah. know, the the classes, the classes and things are, are canceled, and the programs aren't there. But there's so many, 
so many emergencies, so many, you know, this, this just changed, this just happened. Somebody's in need of help. And, uh, so the day, the day ends up pretty much just as full, but, um, but without so many things scheduled. Yeah. I go to the office every day. Of course, uh, we have a limited staff in the building. They're all, all working from home. Not all of them are working from home, but the day is full. I mean, you know, it just, um, meetings, zoom meetings, a lot of, I have three zoom meetings tomorrow. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm getting very Lots of zoom. With zoom. We're all contributing to zoom stock. If we could go yeah. back two months in time, uh, Joel, what about so, you? Anything new at home? Sorry. I was going to, okay. I was going to say, I wish Joel would teach me guitar, which he started to do before the quarantine. And I'm not a very good student, but anything you've been learning or new things, Joel? Oh, you're muted again. Sorry. Okay. You, <laughs> you hear forget. me now? Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's the problem with these fancy microphones, you know. So, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I have been using my time. Uh, honestly, practicing a lot, playing a lot of music and learning new music. And uh, yeah. uh, we're spending time as a family uh, in, in the yard, playing with the kids and doing some stuff. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm basically most of the time playing. So ask Fanny. She's kind of crazy yeah. right now because I'm playing all the time. So we introduced you to Garth Brooks right before the quarantine. So I hope you're I'm learning. On Garth I'm learning. Brooks. From, yeah, I'm learning some music from him <laughs> and other. Yeah, I'll show you. <laughs> Father, I think we have a caller. Who do we yeah. Got so there? this is uh, Gary Schindler. Oh, uh, uh, there, Gary. Gary, you're there. Clay, go ahead. Gary, are you there? I'm here. Yes. I got a question, uh, Bishop. Yeah? Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yep. I'm here. You? Okay. <laughs> uh, Gary, if you could mute your, your phone or your computer then we won't have the feedback, but you can go ahead. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. My question is, what was your experience coming here to a, uh, the Wichita diocese that's a stewardship diocese versus, uh, where you came from? That's a great question. question. Uh, you know, the most obvious difference is the uh, of how we fund our schools here compared to where I was in Illinois? Uh, all the all the schools and all our Catholic schools in in Illinois were funded by um, you know not only parish support but also tuition, uh, and that's true for grade schools and high schools. And so that was a big part of of our um, of our experience there, and uh, we just more or less took that for granted. So coming here and then learning about stewardship, which is more than just how we fund our schools, but that's a big significant part of it, was a, was a real learning experience for me uh, to, to see that the people here, uh, not, you know, blowing smoke or anything, but the people here uh, really uh, embrace that way of life. And one of the benefits of a uh, stewardship diocese that we can offer um, a good quality Catholic education to everyone who chooses it uh, when the whole parish or a whole diocese embraces stewardship. Uh, that's a, that's a dynamic that I wasn't, I mean, I, I mean, it's not a criticism of where I came from, but, but that's a dynamic we weren't really used to. And so I was just amazed by that actually amazed. Uh, that that this way of life, stewardship as a total way of life, is is so part of the the faith community here for long, long, many, many years, and and so that's um, and we and you know, I mean, we all should know that we're seen throughout the whole United States as the stewardship diocese, and that's a that's a scary thing, and it's an exciting thing. <laughs> It's exciting because it's brought so many blessings and will continue to do so. It's a little scary, at least to me, 
uh, because it requires constant faith and and renewal and a, a revitalization of the of the way of the discipleship way of life in order to to uh, to continue to live as stewards. So, but you know, not, not only in schools, but also think of our vocations. You know, uh, a direct. I think a direct result of people living the stewardship way of life, uh, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament all throughout the diocese. So many places have um, many adoration chapels or times where people are always in front of the Blessed Sacrament. Uh, obviously, receiving Holy Communion at Mass, but also I want very soon to get our people back to adoring the Blessed Sacrament because that's the powerhouse a powerhouse of a, a source of grace for us. And um, I don't want to rob our, our diocese of that, of that grace. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it was, it was kind of amazing to, to step into this and to, to think, okay. And one priest back home, back in Illinois, he said, uh, he goes, well, he says, you know, you, uh, that's all on your shoulders now. <laughs> and to take it forward and uh and i feel sometimes the weight of that responsibility but i also understand that we share that together so um just the invitation from me and all our pastors all our priests and religious all our lay faithful to embrace stewardship uh with ever renewed um vitality is important and uh, so 25 or 30 years from now and sooner when a new bishop comes, a new priest come, and they'll be able to receive what we handed on to them, and then they will have the responsibility to pass it on for another generation. So, you know, We were talking the other night, we had um, some of our seminarians on the show, and um, I always think, you know, we, we talk here in Wichita about our um, <coughs> you know, stewardship and vocations and adoration, and, and um, we're talking about how those three things, that I, I really think they go together. You know, with Stewardship, we, we teach kids to, you know, use their lives to do God's will. And then we take them to adoration where we teach them how to ask God what his will is. And then it's just kind of natural that that would lead to people following their vocation, no matter what that, that vocation might be. Um, I've got a question that was posted on the, the live chat, and, and I'll address it coming from a, a parish perspective. But then, Bishop, if you would kind of talk about what's going on around the diocese. But the question is about those people whose sacramental preparation was interrupted. Um, and in this case, the family, uh, this past Sunday, we had First Communion scheduled. And, um, and this is a, a homeschool family who, um, you know, so for, for them, and so here at, here at St. Anne, for the children who are preparing for First Communion, um, those in, in Catholic school and, and in this situation, um, we're, we're presumed their, um, their formation has been continuing. And then whenever we're able to celebrate Mass, um, we'll, we'll do that. We'll celebrate First Communion. Unfortunately, with our PSR, we kind of just had to suspend those classes. Um, and so when we're able to resume classes, we'll resume that, uh, that uh, their, their, their formation, their preparation for that, and then celebrate First Communion somewhere um, down the line. Um, Bishop, you want to add about in, you know, how things like that are going around the diocese or other people's experiences? I, you know, I, I don't have any firsthand knowledge I, other than I think everybody's just waiting. Um, the pastors are just waiting for an opportunity uh, to do to uh, celebrate those sacraments. I know we have um, identified for the uh, adults, uh, the catechumens and the elect, uh, the elect and the candidates to be received into the church uh, on the vigil of Pentecost, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, great, great feast to do that. Uh, far as far as First Holy Communion, <clears throat> I think, um, you know, and, and all the, also the confirmations, mm -hmm. as soon as we possibly can, uh, I don't think any of us want to, to see those delayed or, or even, I, I, just, I don't think anybody's considering delaying them till the following year or anything. So um, it, may be imp it may be necessary for us to celebrate them in a slightly different way with maybe less people. Uh, but I think the most important thing is, is that we have a plan. We'll know more, of course, when we can open up public masses and kind of get a sense of how that's going to go. 
I think we'll have a clearer idea about that in about three or four weeks. Yeah, the word whenever has been getting used a lot. What's that? The word whenever Mm -hmm. has been getting used a lot. Like, we don't know when it's going to happen. We just, we want it to happen soon. We're all waiting on certain Mm -hmm. things that are outside of our control. Right. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of sadness about that. I, I feel that, you know, I loved First Holy Communion as a parish priest. It was a big celebration, always for our parishes, um, to see the children dress up and, and, and receive Jesus for the first time. We can still do that. It just may be, uh, you know, it's going to be delayed and, and, and maybe just slightly different, but it'll still be a, a joyful celebration. We're, we're now trying to uh, plan for ordinations, uh, which are at the end of May, uh, slightly at the end of May, and we're trying to figure out how that's going to look. Um, it's going to be some, somewhat different than we're normally used to here. But I have uh, I have the joy of saying that the men who are to be ordained, all of them, the five deacons and the three priests, all have said what's really important is the ordination, not how many people are there or you know what kind of fanfare we do it. It's really the right of ordination because they're they're yearning to be ordained. That really um, that really inspired me to. Uh, I mean, they've been working so hard all these years preparing for this, and now to see this uh, celebrated in a different way is is uh, is is, uh, is sad. But it, but it, but it reminded me of these are men that are really in touch with what's really important. Certainly. So related to that, so uh, when the seminarians were here uh, a couple weeks ago, so one is preparing to be ordained a deacon, uh, one was preparing to be ordained a priest, and so they were talking about that, you know, the possibility that they, you know, maybe be celebrating their ordinations in private, even without their families there, and we're talking about which would be worse, to not have your family there for your diaconate ordination, or to not have your family there for your priesthood ordination. So I'm going to throw it to you, of the three, which would be the worst, if you're if if uh if you couldn't have your family there for uh for diaconate priesthood or episcopal uh which would <laughs> like which would which would uh tear at your heart the most i think the priesthood yeah yeah you know the uh, uh i mean it's important it's very important a cleric and everything you enter into the life of the clerical state but it's as we say, it's transitional <laughs> and it moves, it's, it's meant to move you from, uh, although you still retain the character of the deacon, it's meant to move you to the priesthood. So I, I would think personally, you know, the priesthood, but, you know, I was so blessed to have my parents present for my Episcopal ordination and not many people, I mean, you know, there's no guarantees of that. And, uh, of my priesthood classmates, I'm the only one with my parents still living. Uh, wow. So it was it was wonderful. It was it was it was incredible for my parents to witness that. So I can't really, you know, say that would be. Yeah. Um, I, but I would say the priesthood is what they yearn for the most. So the the, Our, this, the episcopacy uh, was a surprise. The priesthood <laughs> was planned. I remember the beautiful moment of being called out from your family at diaconate. That um, was such a beautiful, I mean, the symbolism of the liturgy being actually called from your family to the altar was, that's something uh, Will Stever ex- expressed as well, um, that that would, that would be really hard. But um, I think it's, they're all so wonderful to share with, with everyone. And I remember riding a bus with a bunch of your family on the way, and we, when I was a seminarian, we helped host your family and friends for your ordination. I remember riding a bus from the hotel over to the cathedral with, with your a bunch of people from Shumway, Illinois, and that was just a fantastic okay. experience. <laughs> <laughs> they were just looking at all these big buildings and cathedral and everything. It was. It's wonderful. like the Clampets coming to the big city. <laughs> <laughs> Father, we got another caller. Joanne, Joanne Cooper's on the phone. Joanna, what would you like to ask Bishop? Are you there, Joanna? Joanne? Say it again, Father. Are you there, Joanna? 
Yes, I am. Well, what would you like to ask Bishop tonight? Well, there it's not really so much a question. Hi, Bishop. Uh, Hi there. I got, I got the opportunity to meet with you about the backpack program several years ago, yeah. and um, it went quite well, thanks to your blessings. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, but the reason I'm calling tonight is not so much questioning, but just thanking uh, both Father David, Father Clay, and you, because... I understand from your standpoint, I watched the news tonight and they talked about the effects that things are starting to have on uh, the, the people that are in the upfront lines and how hard it is emotionally. And um, I know it's got to be stressful on your side. And instead of just, you know, sometimes I find myself thinking, oh, I want to go to communion so bad. And, you know, but then I think, like Father David said tonight, how hard it is for for the priests every day to do this Mass and not be able to share that communion with us. And I just want to thank you guys for all that you do, because uh, we're very fortunate, uh, and especially St. Anne's is fortunate for, for our priests and for their dedication. And uh, you're lucky, Bishop, that you've got these two men, <laughs> because, because it's been... Uh, a real pleasure to watch them pick up the pieces and make them whole during this time of, of a crisis. It's, it's just been very comfortable. So, and I want to thank you for all that you do, Bishop, and I'm sure as soon as you can, you'll get us back to church. And um, I have uh, been ill for a couple of years and hadn't been able to go to Mass uh, very frequently anyway, so I had been going on EWTN. And so I'm one of the people that find this precious time because now I get to come back to my parish at St. Anne's, which I hadn't been able to do for a couple of years. So it, it, this has been a, a really kind of a positive for me instead of a negative, except for the communion part of it. And I had um, one of the sisters of St. Joseph that said, dear friend of mine, brought me communion uh, until all this started happening. So I was fortunate enough to have almost daily communion. So... But anyway, I just want to say thank you for all that all of you are doing and that I hope you know how much we appreciate it. And Father David, not to sound like your mother, but you look tired. And I know you didn't get to go on your vacation, and I know that you haven't been on retreat, so I hope soon you get to do something in that way just so that you uh, get to refresh and renew. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was very nice. That was beautiful. We are blessed as well. So blessed. Um, Indeed. So we want to um, give people a chance here to post prayer intentions, and then we'll wrap up by praying for those things. Um, Bishop, I had a quick text in question. I, I think it's what it's about. Was Father Capon's um, veneration venerable decision postponed because of coronavirus during this right, time right yes uh, uh it was due to be uh determined on march 8th and uh rome was um prior just prior to that was was uh the vatican was all um shut down went, went into a shelter in place so all the offices and just like here and so all the con congregations in rome that were working on all that have uh have not been able to attend to that. So, you know, we had great hopes, obviously, yeah. uh, and 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 expectations that he will he will receive this uh, determination venerable. And they, as much as told me that in Rome, I don't want to second guess them or anything. Yeah. Um, I mean, anything could happen, but but they, as much as told me, it was a really really good cause. Beautiful. And so we were hoping that we would hear hear that by by then or shortly after that. So that's all yet to be determined. That'll be a great day to look forward to when we can call him venerable, uh, Father Emil Capon. And then, you know, God willing, sometime blessed Emil Capon. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you, Father. Uh, Bishop, would, uh, would you close us in prayer after Father gives us our prayer intentions for sure. the evening? Go ahead. Oh, we have been, uh, calling around to our parishioners and a number of them have given us prayer intentions and 
Um, so Victoria wants us to pray for her family, uh, Anthony, uh, for his dad who recently fell, uh, Kalinda for, for her husband and for her, for her family, uh, uh, Sherry for all children, uh, Sam and Judy uh, for continued blessings as they're uh, celebrating 55 years uh, married together um, and for their health, uh, Tasha uh, for uh, just for a return to normality. Uh, I know a lot of people are praying for that. Uh, Mark for uh, for Megan who has cancer. Uh, Melanie uh, for her parents. Uh, Anna for her son uh, who has kidney stones and is going in to have them removed soon. Uh, for uh, Kay Palmer has asked us to pray for everyone in that uh, the nursing home in Clearwater uh, that's had so many outbreaks down there. Uh, Erica uh, for the Robles and Sarmiento families. Uh, the Cardenas family um, celebrating 15, or 17 years of marriage. Um, uh, Teresa for her daughters, uh, all of whom are doctors. Um, and so on the on the front lines, the Andrade Aguilar family uh, for their family. I'm going to pray for the repose of the soul of Maria Elena Garcia, uh, the repose of the soul of Craig Ewing, um, who just, uh, he just passed away. And uh, for those who, who know him, um, the family is going to be waiting and do services. His brother lives in North Carolina, and so when his brother is able to come, they're going to do the services. Uh, for the repose of the soul of, uh, for Tony Stiles, uh, and for the healing of his family, um, we also pray for, um, let's see, uh, for uh, Karen Johnson's dad, who just had a pacemaker put in, And we want to pray for uh, pray for everyone. Pray for um, for all of our parishioners. Pray for all of us uh, around the diocese. Um, if we could just entrust everyone to uh, to the care of Our Lady, Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Anne, pray, pray for, for us. us. And Bishop, Bishop may we have a blessing. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. With your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for sharing with us the great good news of the gospel. We look forward to share with you again next week in your program, St. Anne, Quarren Street. God bless.